Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is KK Poon. I'm the director of the uh, Lodge Registers Foundation on Public Understanding of Risk. And today I have a great privilege and honor to uh, welcome our guest, a, uh, Dr. Sean Hagerty. Oh, Hagerty. Um, he's the executive director of the Center for the Study of Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge. We are kind of very lucky that Sean with us because um, we kind of like hijacked him. We are having a workshop on risk and AI. Uh, this is organized together with the um, Center for the Study of Existential Risk, our Center for Strategic Futures, that's under our PMO, and also the Center for Future of Intelligence. So there's going to be an interesting discussion from Wednesday to Friday. But today, um, Sean is here to give us a seminar on the future of artificial intelligence. I think this is a topic that is definitely topical and all of us are certainly looking forward to it. Um, whenever I think about artificial intelligence, um, I always think about the Terminator. You know? My whole brain is influenced by movies. But some of you may be thinking a little bit about Short Circuit. I don't know whether you all watched that movie, that cute little robot um, that's very adorable. So there's a whole range of stuff here that, that you know that's influencing um, our ideas about what artificial intelligence is all about. Um, um, Sean, Sean um, besides um, being the um, executive director for the Center of Existential Risk, um, he's also the academic manager at the Future of Humanity Institute um, at the University of Oxford. His current focus is on risk and impacts of emerging technology, including near-term impacts of AI and robotics, biotechnology, um, including uh, synthetic biology and genomics, surveillance technology, and uh, existential risk. Prior to joining the Future of Humanities uh, Institute, Sean completed a PhD in genome um, evolution at Trinity College uh, Dublin, uh, where he worked on bioinformatics uh, software design. Um, he has actually published in a very diverse uh, set of fields, including genomics, molecular evolution, and artificial intelligence. Um, he has a degree in human genetics and is a scholar of Trinity College. So I wouldn't want to take up too much of your time. Can we put our hands together and welcome Sean? Thank you. It's a real privilege to be here today. And I'm really looking forward to spending the next week learning a lot more than I think I'll be teaching. Um, about the applications and developments of artificial intelligence. There's just such a huge amount of fascinating work happening here in Singapore. But today I'm going to give a brief overview of some of the issues that we're working on at um, the Center for the Study of Existential Risk and the Center of the Future of Intelligence, which is the second center that we recently established at the University of Cambridge on the impacts and challenges that artificial intelligence will pose in the near term and um, looking a little bit further forwards. When talking about the risks associated with um, a technology, I think it's always important to consider at the same time the benefits of it, um, because otherwise we get a very one-sided view um, of a technology. And a technology like artificial intelligence in particular is uh, inherently dual use or general purpose. It affects so many different industries in so many different ways. So within this talk, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about some of the risks in the near and long term that we've been looking at in artificial intelligence, but also some of the ways in which artificial intelligence is going to be a powerful and potent tool um, for us in dealing with many of the global challenges that we're going to be facing in the 21st century. Um, towards the end of the talk, I'm going to speak a little bit about the um, prospect of artificial general intelligence. This is not the AI we have in the world today, but um, a long-held goal in the field to um, create AI that is capable of the general sort of problem-solving and understanding of the world that we humans are capable of. Uh, we haven't achieved this. We don't know how far away it is, but if we were to achieve it, it would have uh, momentous consequences. And I'll finish by saying a little bit about the incredibly exciting growth of a global community working towards um, the beneficial application and uses of artificial intelligence and the mitigation of risk worldwide. So 
to start. I don't know if any of you um, watched the famous uh, game of AlphaGo um, versus Lee Seedal in uh, 2016. Uh, we got up at, I think it was 3.45 a.m. to watch it in Cambridge. And it was a bit of a remarkable experience, not only because AlphaGo won four out of five games, but it played in ways that to the Go playing community were novel and fascinating. Um, the European Go champion um, famously remarked after one um, particularly surprising move that um, Go, uh, AlphaGo made that he'd never seen a human play this kind of move. It was a beautiful and creative move. In the same year, DeepMind, who are the company who developed AlphaGo, um, announced another um, achievement, which got less fanfare, was less flashy. But for those of us who are interested in how AI can help us with global challenges, it was every bit as exciting. They applied their machine learning algorithms to um, managing the um, cooling of um, Google server farms and achieved a reduction of about 40% on the amount of energy needed to um, cool the servers which is really a huge amount. And it points to the kind of massive benefits that artificial intelligence could help us with so many of the complicated systems that we rely on in the world, whether it's energy grids or water management or um, our transport. So why is this all happening now? Well, artificial intelligence has been around for the guts of the last century. It can loosely be defined as computer systems that are able to perform tasks that would normally require human intelligence. Um, the field came into being in, um, well, it's hard to define, but a lot of people would say the 40s and 50s. And it's gone through several um, cycles of hype and disappointment since AI summers and winters. Along that time, a lot of important progress has been happening in um, the fundamental theories uh, underpinning artificial intelligence. But the practical application to real world challenges has been a little more limited than it is at present. In the last decade in particular, it's been different. The current AI revolution is in large part based on techniques um, around machine learning. These are statistical approaches that allow computer systems to learn from data and then to make predictions or take actions guided by the data that they take in. Um, machine learning uh, approaches include neural networks. Deep learning is a particularly powerful neural network based approach. And many of these techniques have been around since the 80s, um, but they were limited in their effectiveness until recently because it turned out there simply wasn't enough data and powerful enough computers to allow them to work well. So you could say that three main things are driving this current boom in AI. Advances in computing power, an explosion in um, the available data, and advances in the, the techniques themselves. And what we've seen is that there's been a threshold passed in recent years whereby these systems are now really useful in the real world, which has ex fueled an explosion of investment and talent pouring into AI research uh, and further pushes forward progress. Machine learning is creeping into and improving the performance of a lot of different things that we just take for granted in the world. This includes web search engines, taking good quality photographs on your mobile phone, Netflix recommendations for what movies you like based on what other people like you have um, gone on to like, um, translation between languages, turning speech into text, um, high frequency trading in finance, banks use it to detect fraudulent transactions. It's of course enabling the progress um, of driverless cars, drones, and a lot of other forms of robotics. But I think this is the tip of the iceberg and there's a lot more to come. Uh, for me, some of the most important applications are going to come in areas that are critical to our global future, like energy, healthcare, and sustainability more broadly. To give one example of how this might work. So right now, renewables like solar power often have limited effectiveness because they're a bit unpredictable um, because you can't predict um, how the weather is going to go, um, you don't know how much energy is going to come through solar, and you have to keep your fossil fuel um, power plants running in order to have a steady stream of um, energy coming into the grid. However, in Colorado, um, what one company did in um, collaboration with the Colorado Grid 
was use AI um, to monitor and analyze, um, first of all, information coming in from all the different solar um, power plants that were in that region and link that to uh, information from um, um, satellites in space and weather um, forecasting systems to develop a much more dynamic way of um, predicting um, what the power um, output was going to be from um, solar plants, which meant that then um, they could shut down the fossil fuel plants um, much more of the time and then turn them on when they're needed and thus boost the efficiency of the overall system by um, a tremendous amount. In healthcare, artificial intelligence is being applied to everything from um, drug discovery to analysis of imaging data that often requires deep human expertise and an awful lot of time. People are using it to predict um, outbreaks of dengue fever by taking into account a lot of different um, parameters such as um, geography and weather and movement of species and um, even more mundane things like managing schedules and procuring um, various equipment in hospitals. And if we're ever to unlock the scientific and medical potential that is offered by the data that we're now starting to generate from our genomes, our epigenomes, um, our proteomes, we're going to need systems that are able to make sense of all this complex data and spot the patterns and interactions um, between these systems. AI is also being applied to medical literature searches and we hope in time we'll be able to generate novel hypotheses and accelerate the scientific process. To take a big picture view of this, we're moving towards a smart world. A world in which we can gather ongoing information on a huge range of different factors affecting our health on an individual and a population level, information on the appliances in our smart homes, um, a world where sensors will track the water and nutrient levels of fields, we'll have drones and satellites tracking migration of animals, and where we can monitor the as um, performance of every aspect of our energy grids, our water networks, our transport. Now this data is going to be tremendously powerful, but we can only use it if we have methods for sorting it, analyzing it, spotting the patterns, and using all of this in an ongoing and dynamic way to make forecasts or determine the right actions to take, both at the level of the overall system and at the level of the individual components of the system. And that could mean flagging that the coal plant needs to be um, turned on before a cloudy period um, where the solar um, generators won't work. It could mean automatic application of fertilizer to a field exactly when it's needed or flagging an anomaly on a health scan to identify to a human doctor that this patient needs urgent attention. It's said that 90% of the data in the world has been created in the last two years, and that that trend is only going to accelerate. And this means that artificial intelligence is going to be absolutely essential. We just can't hope to make sense of all this data and to understand these complex interactions between the different variables without the sort of tools it offers us. The explosion of data also means that AI itself will only um, keep becoming more effective and more applicable to uh, different domains. So we can expect a virtuous cycle. From a global risk perspective, this means that AI is going to be a tremendously powerful tool in our arsenal for combating um, challenges of the 21st century like climate change. And we'll be using artificial intelligence to make renewable energy more efficient, to reduce energy use in um, servers and on energy grids, um, to develop smart farms, and to help us produce more efficient materials. It'll also help with climate modeling and with predicting the local effects um, of climate change on ecosystems and agriculture. In health, it'll allow us to make more sophisticated treatments be available to more and more people. It'll help us develop drugs more quickly. And in future, it'll hopefully help us predict and respond to infectious disease outbreaks more quickly and thus intervene more quickly in potential pandemic outbreaks. In resource use in agriculture, AIs um, will help us use water more efficiently in cities and rural areas. It's already being applied to um, monitoring and predicting pipe leakages in the United Kingdom. Smart farms will allow us to produce more and to do so more sustainably, for example, by cutting down on uh, fertilizer use. In the longer term, some of the most exciting um, prospects 
are likely to come from ways in which artificial intelligence will accelerate um, various of our scientific processes and help us achieve breakthroughs in ways that we can't necessarily yet foresee. Now, I started by talking about all these things because I'm going to spend some time speaking about the risks from artificial intelligence as well. But I think it's inc incredibly important that we bear in mind that artificial intelligence is inherently um, general use. And while we certainly should be thinking about the risks, we shouldn't l lose sight of the benefits while doing so. I mean, all of us who work on the risks of artificial intelligence do so because we're excited about the various um, prospects for artificial intelligence helping us with many of the global challenges we face. But because artificial intelligence is so inherently um, general purpose, it certainly will pose new challenges and risks in a variety of different domains. So last year, we brought together in Cambridge researchers from machine learning, cybersecurity, robotics, drones, risk, law, and policy to look at emerging threats from the malicious use of artificial intelligence. In other words, the deliberate use of artificial intelligence to cause harm or attacks on AI systems done with the intention of causing harm. Uh, we looked um, in particular at information security, so for example, cyber attack and cyber defense, physical security, so for example, drones and robotics either being hacked or being um, repurposed for attacks, and political security, um, that is, democratic processes, um, how they might be threatened by targeted propaganda, fake images and fake video, and the potential for much more powerful surveillance to, um, methods to be developed. We identified three key trends in the way that artificial intelligence may affect security. One is the expansion of existing threats. Um, the second is the introduction of new types of threats. And the third is a change in the character of the sorts of threats we face. To give you a few examples of what I mean by these. Expansion of existing threats. One example of this um, might be more widespread use of sophisticated cyber attack techniques. Um, consider, for example, um, spear phishing. So phishing in cybersecurity is the practice of, um, for example, sending you an email um, to try and trick you into giving um, away sensitive information like your passport um, word or your financial details. And most phishing attempts are very crude. So the stereotype is you get the email from a prince who says that you'll get $50 million into your bank account if you open, um, you know, if you just give them the bank details. And most people have seen these and know not to go anywhere near them. But they're very cheap and they're easy to send to a lot of people. And so people send them in the hope that some people are foolish and will uh, fall for them. On the other hand, spear phishing is when usually a person or a team of people go to a much more sophisticated length to gather an awful lot of information, to first of all identify a high priority target because you're wealthy or because you're in some sort of influential position, then to gather an awful lot of information about that person, and then to carefully craft a handcrafted attack on um, that person, either by um, posing as somebody you know or including information that is specific to you, um, anything that will make it look like something that's legitimate and not just one of these mass-produced emails. Now, right now, that requires a lot of human expertise and a lot of effort, so it doesn't happen so often. But the techniques that we're developing with artificial intelligence could, in principle, be um, repurposed to automate some of these processes, gather more information automatically about people, help um, automatically identify high-priority targets and um, give the human attacker a prioritized list, um, one could, for, um, for example, um, use fake images, fake text in order to um, fool people more effectively. And the concern is that, therefore, suddenly a type of attack that would have been fairly limited in how often it would happen and require a lot of human expertise might happen in a much more wide-scale uh, way. And there are similar trends that one might consider in, for example, using a robot or a drone to carry out attacks. Maybe in the past it would have required a very well-resourced group to do it, but if drones and the ability to manipulate drones through AI are available more cheaply to a lot more people, we might see um, an expansion of the kinds of um, attacks and an increase in the number of these attacks going forwards. A second trend is the introduction of new threats. It may be possible to use AI to carry out types of attacks that have not been possible in the past. For example, um, 
AI could be used to um, identify and exploit vulnerabilities in software in ways that haven't been possible before. Um, AI could be used to um, create convincing video and audio of people saying things that they haven't said, which could be used, for example, to fool you into thinking this is a message from somebody you know, or it could be used to fool you into thinking that a political leader has said something that they actually didn't say. In the physical realm, AI will allow the development um, of new types of weapons that haven't been possible in the past, such as um, coordinated drone swarms, large groups of small coordinated flying robots um, which can operate and perhaps target a, an assailant um, autonomously, and these may be very difficult to defend against. AI systems themselves may be vulnerable, in fact will be vulnerable, to new types of attacks. For example, it's been shown that um, one can fool an AI system into thinking a stop sign is actually a go sign just by tweaking a couple of key pixels. It'll still look like a stop sign to a person, but it would fool the um, AI system. This is known as an adversarial attack. A change in the character of threats. Overall, our group of experts concluded that we can expect AI-enabled attacks of these sorts to be especially effective, finely targeted, likely to exploit vulnerabilities in AI systems, and difficult to attribute. To explain this last point, as AI becomes used to automate many of the processes involved in a physical or cyber attack, it'll serve to increase the distance between the attacker and the target, both in, um, in physical space, um, the person might be far away and um, like allowing an autonomous attack to uh, um, occur, uh, and also in inferential distance. So it may end up being very unclear who carries out an attack with a drone or, for example, a cyber attack on an energy grid. It may also be possible to leave false clues that make it look like somebody else did it. And this will introduce, um, introduce challenging new problems for national and international security. These things I mentioned are a very brief overview of a report that runs to 100 pages. I do recommend the full report, which is available freely online for a proper discussion. More broadly, we need to be mindful that our world is becoming increasingly interconnected and increasingly digital. More and more data is being collected about each of us. More of our infrastructure is becoming digitally connected and some will become digitally controlled. Um, networks like the ever-growing Internet of Things are notoriously insecure. And into this world, we're introducing the tools of artificial intelligence. Uh, this is not to say that we shouldn't do this, but we will need to do careful analysis, foresight, and encourage deep collaboration between um, research leaders in artificial intelligence, experts in risk, and domain-specific experts from across all the areas to be affected by AI in order to anticipate these new threats and to work together to prevent them. Now, deliberate malicious uses of artificial intelligence are only a subset of the kind of threats um, or the challenges that we may face with artificial intelligence going forward. Um, there is a growing community worldwide working on a, a much broader range of issues as well that I'll run through briefly. One is the issue of algorithmic bias. So AI systems are trained on the data that we give them. If this data contains explicit or um, implicit biases, such as historical sexism or racism, there is a risk that the outputs or decisions of AI systems may reflect or exacerbate this bias. Um, for example, uh, AI systems have been used in um, judicial processes in the United States to try to predict um, whether criminals are likely to reoffend. But um, some of the investigations in the, into this seem to indicate that, um, well, the system predicts much more often than is reasonable that somebody from a poor socioeconomic background or somebody um, from an ethnic minority is more likely to reoffend. And it's a real concern that if we don't address these um, biases creeping into the use of AI systems, then all we'll end up doing is locking in or exacerbating these existing biases. Automation and employment. A growing body of research is looking at um, what occupations um, might be at risk from automation um, from AI. This doesn't just mean jobs that can be entirely automated and replaced by an AI system, but if an AI system makes the work of a lawyer or an administrator or a doctor 100 times as effective as in the past, then either there needs to be more work 
or there um, will be fewer jobs. It's also worth bearing in mind that when you automate certain sectors like, um, for example, truck driving, you don't just um, automate away the people who drive the trucks, you also have to think about the infrastructure around that, the motels, the um, you know, rest stops, um, the shops, everything around that. And one potential concern is that because um, advances in AI are being applied to a number of different domains at the same time, we might see a range of different sectors become automated at the same time. How, however, experts are divided about, first of all, the rate at which this will happen, um, and also the question of what new jobs will be created by artificial intelligence. There will certainly be a lot of new jobs created, but one question is, will there be enough jobs um, created to replace the ones that have been automated in the past? And also, will the people who are losing their jobs um, in the current uh, round of automation be well placed to get the jobs that are created in the future? And if not, how do we manage that transition period? Data privacy is a key concern in Europe. It's reflected heavily in the European Union's general um, data protection um, regulation, GDPR, especially in cases like um, people's individual health data. So gathering this data and being able to analyze it is going to be incredibly important for doing um, population-wide studies that will tell us things about the underlying bases of um, uh, diseases like cancer and also why certain um, treatments work better for um, some people and not others, which will allow us to develop better health care for individuals. On the other hand, we do need to be mindful of people's right to their own data and people's concern that, for example, if your data um, is gathered, it may end up in the hands of people who you might not necessarily want to have that data. So, for example, your health data, if it were in the hands of an insurer, might be used to say, maybe we don't want to insure you because you have a higher risk um, of heart attacks. Um, now, there are techniques being explored for um, guaranteeing privacy in different um, so, uh, sorts and for protecting people's um, data through legal and regulatory methods, but it's very much an open question and one that really needs to be solved if we're to be able to use um, data effectively, which is essential to AI being able to help us with many of the most important challenges it can. AI in safety critical settings. We're going to be bringing artificial intelligence into healthcare, transport, um, energy management, water management, systems that our world and our um, lives depend on heavily. We need to make sure that these systems are robust, um, reliable, and that we fully understand what are the circumstances in which they might not um, operate well and what are the circumstances in which we might need to intervene. This is a growing area of research, both on the technical side, um, on questions like, well, how do you um, design a system that knows when to shut down if it's getting uh, inputs from its environment that are different from its um, training set? And also on the kind of human-machine interaction side, how do you make sure that your human experts are able to um, know what to do if they've been reliant on the AI system on, up until that point? This feeds into the question of explainability. So many um, AI systems have an element of the black box to them in that they um, give us the right answer, but we don't necessarily know exactly what's happening under the hood to give that answer. So now a huge amount of research is going into technical ways of designing systems so they tell you what's happening at various stages of the process. And again, on the human-machine interaction side, how do you make sure that people maintain meaningful understanding of the systems they're using? Lastly, um, diversity and inclusion. If artificial intelligence is going to affect so many different um, walks of life, um, so many different parts of our community and so many different cultures, we need to make sure that the people to be affected um, are involved in the decision-making process. If truck drivers are, drivers are going to be affected by automation, they should be represented in discussions about how AI is um, being applied to these sectors. Um, if artificial intelligence is going to be um, applied to help disabled um, people um, navigate, then we need to be able to draw on their expertise in the development and decision-making process. Lastly, I'd like to um, give a little bit of thought to the longer-term future of artificial intelligence. From the beginning of the field, it's long been the goal not just to create the kind of AI systems we have now, but to try to create true general intelligence, the kind of intelligence um, capable of performing most or any um, intellectual task that a human being can. 
This is um, often called artificial general intelligence or strong AI. All the machine learning systems we have in the world today can be considered narrow AI. They um, can achieve human level or even superhuman um, level performance on well-defined specific tasks in specific domains, whether that's playing chess or um, navigating traffic. But they lack the capabilities that um, we have as humans in terms of long-term planning, and not just solving problems, but defining new problems, understanding the world around us in a meaningful way. Now, many AI scientists think that, in principle, it should be possible to create general artificial intelligence that would have these capabilities. The thing is that we have no idea how far we are away from achieving this, or how many scientific problems there uh, are remaining to be solved to get there. And critics would often point out that we're still so far from properly understanding human intelligence, or even understanding the intelligence of animals, that we may have a long way to go before creating general intelligence. But others would disagree. And in fact, it's entirely possible that we might create general artificial intelligence before we properly understand biological intelligence, much as we created aeroplanes before we understood all aspects of bird flight. And there's been promising recent pro progress in systems that are able to learn from scratch to perform a, a well at a range of different tasks, including DeepMind's DQN, which can learn from scratch to play a range of different Atari games simply by playing um, the games, rather than being hard programmed um, with the rules. And a growing number of leading research groups around the world are working towards this goal of general intelligence, including um, groups like DeepMind, Vicarious, OpenAI, and a range of academic groups. Nonetheless, expert surveys um, think that we are anywhere between, well, the most optimistic experts think a decade away. Others would say um, any time this century. Some would say hundreds of years um, from achieving this. Now, that may not necessarily be a bad thing. Um, this general intelligence, it's a very powerful thing. I mean, our intelligence is what has allowed us to model the world, do planning, define and solve problems. All of this has allowed us to change this planet more than any species that came before us. And not all those changes have necessarily been good. Um, it's allowed us to create science, art, culture, but also climate change and a sixth extinction age. So the implications of creating a new general intelligence um, would be enormous. It's very hard to predict what this intelligence would be like. It would undoubtedly not be um, like us and what the consequences might be. So a growing community has been researching the implications of artificial general intelligence should it be achieved. Uh, a leading artificial intelligence scientist, Stuart Russell, has predicted that it would be the biggest event in human history because of the way it would help us accelerate scientific progress across all domains and help us solve problems that are potentially beyond human ability alone, but also because we'd be bringing a truly new type of intelligence into our world. A particular concern that was originally raised back in the 1960s by the mathematician um, Jack Good is that once certain thresholds and capability for such a system were reached, the system itself might be able to engage in AI research and improve on its own capabilities and intelligence. He famously hypothesized that you could have an intelligence explosion where a system would improve on itself and improve on itself and improve on itself until it would um, quickly become far more intelligent than we ourselves. And in such a circumstance, it might be very difficult for us to maintain, um, remain in control of such a system. Now, experts are divided about whether this is possible, even were we to achieve general intelligence. But whether or not general intelligence would, as Jack Good and people like Nick Bostrom have written about, potentially and quickly really lead to superintelligence, the achievement of AGI would definitely have profound consequences for humanity and its place on this earth. So a growing body of research is focusing on the potential risks from achieving this, whether it's 10 years out or 100 years out. Most prominently, Nick Bostrom's book, Superintelligence, um, published in 2014, explores how artificial general intelligence might pose an existential risk to humanity if we're not very careful in how we develop it. Now, most of this research doesn't necessarily engage with the kind of Hollywood idea of whether AGI would be conscious or whether it would hate us and wish to overthrow us or be evil in some way. Instead, 
it tries to focus on some key difficulties. These include designing goals for such a powerful, flexible system. We can already see, even with narrow systems, that it can be difficult to design goals um, that don't sometimes have unintended consequences um, when um, we take the actions um, to achieve them. With such a capable, powerful system that's able to take such a wide range of actions in a wide range of environments, it'd be very difficult to uh, design goals without unintended consequences. So others have looked at this concept of value alignment. Rather than setting specific goals, try to design AI systems so they have values that are sort of compatible with humanity. However, this also runs up against a whole range of um, difficulties. The first is obviously that a comprehensive set of human values is very difficult to define. Uh, I mean, there are some things that we all agree on, but there's much more that I think we have um, interpersonal and cultural differences on. Um, many important values may not be held across peoples and cultures. So coming up with a set that everyone can agree on and that gives us enough compatibility with such a powerful AI system is a very challenging thing. And a third issue is that translating human values as complicated as they are into principles that can be technically and rigorously defined to guide future AI systems is in itself a really difficult challenge. I don't have time to go into Asimov's laws. People sometimes pose these, but it's worth bearing in mind that he defined these three laws that people like to quote, and they sound great. He defined them so that he could write these books to show all of the different ways in which they go wrong. So a lot of the, uh, this kind of community focused on the long-term issues. Um, the work has been focused on developing technical research agendas to try to translate some of these more philosophical ideas into um, scientific technical problems that can be worked on. Um, some of them um, look at quite theoretical issues that um, may only emerge once um, certain thresholds and capability have um, been passed in AGI development, but where we can do some fundamental work on issues like decision theory and philosophical principles ahead of time. Others work instead from the starting point of behaviors that we see with modern day learning systems um, on the presumption that some of these principles will hold through to the more powerful systems we develop in the future, um, looking at systems like reinforcement learning um, systems. The idea being that if we can address some key issues around avoiding unwanted behaviors and unpredictability in these modern day systems, it'll help us to lay the groundwork for safety in the more powerful systems we may develop in the future. A final area of research focuses more on strategy and governance. If we are likely to achieve this idea of general artificial intelligence, what sorts of collaborations and um, agreements, both intersectoral and international, are we likely to need in order to make sure that the profound benefits that such a breakthrough um, would give us will be shared equally um, and fairly across society and across the world? And um, how do we make sure that the prospect of this breakthrough wouldn't itself lead to conflict as uh, you know, different groups um, race to get there first. Now, those last couple of slides, I want to reiterate, um, are looking at a future challenge that is, as of yet, <laughs> hypothetical, in that artificial intelligence um, the modern day systems we have are certainly not artificial general intelligence, and artificial general intelligence is still 10 years or maybe a lot more away um, based on what most experts think. The view among the long term um, researchers is that given that the challenges may be so difficult and the consequences so great, there's plenty that we should be working on now alongside the more pressing and immediate um, near term issues that I've described. It's certainly not the case that now is when we should be developing regulation or policy around artificial general intelligence, um, given that this is a theoretical future development. And as a result, we simply just don't know enough about the shape of the challenge to do so sensibly. I'd also argue that um, perhaps too much media attention has focused on this idea of superintelligence, terminators, and existential risk. Um, I worry that the negative consequences of this is that it confuses um, the public and even um, you know experts and policymakers about where the technology is now, what it can achieve now, and what needs to be worried about in the near term. Um, some have also raised a concern that these kind of more exciting is the wrong word, but um, more sensational long-term challenges 
are a distraction from very important but somewhat more mundane near-term issues like avoiding bias, making sure that we have um, diversity and representation AI systems, accountability, knowing who's to blame when a self-driving car crashes, and the huge range of other issues that are well-defined where we know who the relevant actors are that we need to be engaging with in the near term. So to be clear, we certainly don't need to worry about superintelligence in the next five years. Um, we do need to worry about the societal impacts of narrow AI systems um, like those I've mentioned, bias and algorithmic systems, employment, explainability, safety in um, critical systems, um, and so forth. <coughs> I also think we do need to be worried about the new security challenges that current uh, and near-term AI developments are going to pose in the next five years, whether in physical warfare, in cyber attack and defense, or in information manipulation of various sorts. It's been quite eye-opening to see what's happened in, happened in the last year. When we originally held the workshop that led to the report I talked about earlier, uh, we hypothesized a number of issues about how you know fake videos and fake audio might be developed and how AI could be used um, in political processes. And then while we were developing the report, we had to keep updating it because things were actually coming out on the news that were relevant to some of the things that our experts had predicted as being two or three years out. And this really just highlights that engaging effectively and in a timely fashion with these rapidly developing challenges is going to require us to be on our game. It's going to need deep and ongoing collaboration between research leaders in AI, um, policymakers, civil society, and the public, um, because they're going to affect so many different aspects of modern life. They can't be solved um, by AI researchers alone, and they can't be solved without the expertise about the AI systems being fed into the process. It's also going to require a deep level of international engagement and collaboration, which is one of the reasons that I'm so excited to be in Singapore this week. Leadership in the development and application of AI systems is now occurring worldwide, in the US, in Europe, in China, Japan, and Singapore, um, and exciting hubs are starting up in India, Africa, South America. And no matter where these breakthroughs happen, the impacts of artificial intelligence are inevitably going to cross international lines and cultural divides. Many of the challenges that artificial intelligence will pose will be shared challenges. I mean, we all want um, safe AI systems, we all want AI to help us with challenges in healthcare. But at the same time, they're going to manifest uh, differently in different cultural contexts, ones with different values, different economic priorities, um, different social priorities, and different problems that um, AI is needed um, to solve. In some cultures, we will need to automate um, certain jobs simply because there aren't enough people um, to do them. Um, in some uh, cultures, well, you know, I was at a workshop in Beijing earlier this year, and you know, the Western attendees talked about uh, applying utilitarian and um, rule-based ethics to AI systems, and the Chinese researchers brought in um, um, uh, brought in concepts from Confucian ethics to um, the ethics underpinning self-driving cars, which was entirely new to me and absolutely fascinating. And we need to be having these conversations now. There's a huge and growing uh, ecosystem of organizations working on these issues. This is just a tiny subset. Um, the Partnership on AI, which is a collaboration of um, leading companies, civil society groups, and academic groups is over 70 organizations alone. And it's worldwide and becoming more so um, with every passing day, including organizations like the AI Now Institute in New York, the Digital Asia Hub in um, China, the um, well um, Center for Excellence in National Security here in Singapore, the Center for Strategic Futures is doing great foresight work, um, Lloyd's is doing great work. Um, and this is exactly what we need. We need to have as many brains on this issue as possible and as many people from the different parts of the world in which AI is being deployed because it's going to be deployed differently in different parts of the world and present different challenges. To conclude, I've discussed a range of the risks and the challenges that AI is going to pose in the near and the long term. And when we consider any new technology, 
it's got the um, potential for positives and negatives. And it don't make sense to anticipate the risks that it poses and to work to prevent and to mitigate them so that um, public confidence in technology is maintained and so that we can really um, deploy AI with confidence and get the benefits from it. But the other side of the equation, the benefits, is something that we can't lose sight of. Those of us who work on the risks of AI do so to make sure that we can benefit from the wide range of opportunities that artificial intelligence provides. So many of the challenges that we face in the 21st century, from the global transition to renewable energy, to providing better healthcare and education to more people, to understanding and preserving the planet's ecosystem, are incredibly complex, are incredibly um, data-driven, and we will definitely need the tools and the analytic capabilities that artificial intelligence will provide us if we're to make headway on them. We're starting to see the first manifestations of this, but I think the biggest opportunities are still to come. For me as a scientist originally, I think I'm still most excited about the opportunities that artificial intelligence presents for helping us to advance scientific progress. I started the lecture by talking about that um, game of Go between AlphaGo and Lee Seedal and the famous move um, 37, the unique creative move that no human being would have thought of playing. Now, for now, this is happening just in games. But I think there will come a point at which more advanced artificial intelligence is able to contribute to scientific discovery by coming at a problem in a fundamentally different way um, and finding a solution that humans wouldn't have found and that we can look at and only regard as beautiful. And for me, I can't imagine anything more exciting than that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, a short question and a, perhaps a longer one. You mentioned a, a report earlier on um, about AI. Could you share with us where, where we can find it? If uh, you Google malicious AI report, you'll find it online. And the report is called the malicious use of AI um, forecasting, anticipation, and mitigation, I think. So this is the report, and the URL I should have here, I believe, is maliciousaireport.com. Thank you. A slightly longer question, perhaps. Um, where do you do you think that the area of uh, mil military, the military, might lead um, the cutting edge of um, AI development, just as it has in the past in various technological areas, like for example, the internet, as we all know, uh, started with um, a research project by the US military. So do you think that um, the militaries around the world would take the lead in developing AI and, you know, and, and of course, that would lead to um, perhaps dangerous uses of, of AI? I think military will play a fairly big role, both in development and deployment of AI. It's been playing a role, actually, for the last couple of decades. Um, DARPA in the US and many other organizations have been providing funding um, for artificial intelligence research throughout the period when it's not been profitable for commerce, for example. And a lot of that has been not necessarily for weaponized pur um, purposes, but also just for analysis of information and so on. Um, right now, we're still seeing quite a lot and a growing amount of military investment. So again, I know that DARPA are putting a lot of money into supporting AI research, which again is not all mil uh, like offensive capabilities, some of it is on questions like explainability, which are incredibly important if you're applying AI in a military setting. But I think the applications to warfare are going to be so profound that there's going to be a big incentive to do so. So I mean, one example is developing systems that are able to carry out targeted um, attacks more effectively. Another is um, analysis of the battlefield. So um, if you've got information coming in about different aspects of the battlefield, if you're able to analyze and automate a lot of that, then you're able to take quicker actions than your adversary. Um, this is known as you know, 
So in military parlance, they talk about the OODA loop, observe, orient, um, decide, act. And if your OODA loop is faster than your adversary, you're usually in a winning position. So if AI systems allow that sort of analysis um, to happen more quickly, then um, that will be useful. Um, also, in like a lot of warfare is infrastructure and logistics. If you're able to manage your supply chains better, you'll do better. Um, on the other hand, I think it's an open question whether military will end up being the key driver or not. And I think there are two factors in that. One is that commerce has now um, played, um, taken such a leading role in AI development. Um, while there's certainly military investment in AI, I think it's still dwarfed by the amount of research funding that's going into Google, Baidu, Tencent, Facebook's AI research, which is very much for um, civilian purposes. Although, adding on to that, there's the issue that a lot of the underlying advances that we might make in civilian AI could quite easily be repurposed to uh, military purposes. So um, one example would be Google's Project Maven, which um, was a contract with um, US defense that Google ended, ended up giving up because of pressure from uh, employees. But that was looking at improving the image recognition from drones. And you can see how improving image recognition in you know, all sorts of civilian uses, whether it's like just kind of tagging your um, friends on images on the internet, um, the underlying advances could be applied in military contexts. Um, I think we're actually at a pivotal moment in well, how AI is used in a range of areas, but particularly the kind of military applications in that once we go too far down the road of military applications of AI, these will become so useful it'll be hard to turn back. But we've seen some very impressive um, action from different groups in recent months and years. Um, research leaders in AI have signed open letters to say that they wanted um, their research to be used to benefit humanity and didn't regard military uses as beneficial. Um, employees at Google have um, threatened to resign, and some of them did resign over Project Maven. There was um, pressure on KAIST, the Korean, uh, I can't remember the acronym, it's a Korean research institute that were planning to do military AI, and um, due to pressure from um, AI research leaders and others, that project was canceled. And there's very interesting kind of legal and policy action happening at the UN level and elsewhere to try to define a number of key issues such as, well, what the human right implications are for somebody to be automatically targeted and killed by an AI system, and what it means to have a human meaningfully in the loop in a decision. So um, in principle, a lot of nations say that they will only use um, military AI to carry out attacks if there is a human in the loop to ultimately make the decision. But you could ask the question, what does it mean to be in the loop? If the decision-making process is so complex and you're just getting a recommendation and it's press the button or don't press the button, are you really in the loop? Um, so this is a topic of a lot of well, kind of legal and research discussion at the moment. And I think the decisions we make about these and the precedents that we put in place now could have a powerful effect on how AI is used in the future. Thank you. Hey, um, you mentioned quite a few near-term risks of AI. I'm wondering whether you'd be able to give us your perspective on the state of attempts to mitigate this, so for example, tools, research, and policy, and what your outlook is on the future um, of efforts to mitigate the near-term risks. Well, I'm quite optimistic. Um, as I see it, the first step is to identify that there are issues here and to better characterize those issues. And I see the right steps starting to happen on that. So, you know, we now have deep expertise coming into on these issues. Um, so on the issue of, for example, bias and inequality being exacerbated by AI systems, we now have, you know, the American Civil Liberties Union getting involved on them. Um, AI now has expertise from the social sciences and um, the research scientists as well, and a range of um, other collaborations like that. Um, and I think that's a good first step in identifying that there is an issue and that it needs to be dealt with. There's interesting technical research being done um, to find ways of sort of 
identifying this happening in practice and mitigating it. Um, I remember reading a really interesting paper last year where researchers from um, uh, one of the Boston universities and I think Microsoft developed a technique where they, let me think, um, so they used mechanical chirp to identify a whole range of instances where sexism was occurring in um, in media that was um, feeding into an AI system that was analyzing them. And then they developed an AI system that effectively was able to flag when it um, was getting data that um, represented bias of certain sorts. So um, a lot of this was word pairing. So for example, man being linked to king and woman to queen wouldn't be seen as a biased word pairing because you know a king is always a man and a queen is always a woman. But if like you very often had man equals CEO and woman equals secretary or homemaker, um, this might be seen as biased because um, I, that doesn't necessarily need to be that way. And what they were then looking at is if their system flags that it's getting this um, kind of input, is it able to sort of correct for it? And they developed some early uh, approaches towards that. And a lot of people are trying different versions um, of ways of developing systems that know when they're getting um, data that's um, biased. Now, technical solutions are only a part of it. I think um, there are also kind of legal regulatory and so on. And a lot of it will be to figure out, well, like at what point do you need to have oversight and in what way? And how do you need to be able to justify decisions? So for example, if an AI system um, is involved in deciding whether a loan for you is approved, um, then, um, for example, the European Union's GDPR says that you should have a right to be able to um, know what basis that decision is being made on, rather than just being a black box answer. The concern being that, for example, an AI system um, drawing on the historical data might say, well, you know, you're a white male in your late 30s, you're historically you have a pretty good chance of paying that back, but you know, you're from a different, you're a woman from a different socioeconomic background, maybe we don't give you the loan, and that's exactly the kind of thing that you want to avoid. So um, putting in place the rules that say you need to know exactly why a um, decision has been made about you, and having human oversight at the right levels is going to be important. Um, and I think similar principles hold in, across a range of these different areas that I look at. Another thing that I hope well, that I think makes me optimistic about this is that I think we can't afford to make too many of these sorts of mistakes before trust in the technology gets lost in a public sphere. I mean, you can afford, like, if there are no lasting consequences to make one or two small mistakes, but if you know big mistakes happen or mistakes happen too often, then you lose trust in AI systems. So like, one concern I would have is that if there are too many self-driving car accidents on the route to deployment um, across the world, then people will simply lose trust in um, these systems. So therefore, we shouldn't um, rush, and we should know exactly why uh, a self-driving car fails and the instances that it fails. Um, I am ultimately optimistic that self-driving cars will provide a lot of benefits in terms of cutting down on road traffic accidents and reducing congestion and reducing emissions. but we do need to get through that teething period. Thank you. Sean, Joe Fan here. Welcome to Singapore. Good to Thank see you. you. Um, I was going to ask what your what do you think is an ideal, what is the ideal role for the global community for beneficial AI? And it's a specific uh, specific issue here. Ian Hogarth wrote on AI. Ian Hogarth, he wrote on AI yeah. nationalism, I think two months ago or three months ago. And in it, he famously quoted Li Kai-Fu. Uh, Li Kai-Fu, who talked about uh, only the United States and China having the depth and breadth, not just of data, but resources in general, to form very deep pools of artificial narrow intelligence, which then they can lease out, okay, quote unquote lease out to technological laggard countries, all right? And this is a sort of um, mother-child relationship, I think that's what Lee kai -fu calls it. Um, fairly poor outcomes, I would say, for technological laggard countries. What, I don't like that future, naturally, okay. 
all right, I don't like that future, but what could a beneficial AI community, a global community of beneficial AI, what could, what could they do differently to bind together to, uh, to shift that trajectory? All right, assuming that we are on the way to that tra trajectory. Curious about your thoughts. Yeah. Okay, these are really big and really good questions. Um, I had the opportunity to discuss some of these issues with Ian Hogarth at, um, before Christmas. He was at a conference in Dixie discussing just this. And I've read the essay that you describe, AI nationalism. I'd recommend it to everyone here. It's a fascinating read looking at various ways in which countries are starting to sort of protect their national interests, so to speak, in AI. And this concern that, as you mentioned, Lee Kai-Fu raised in a great New York Times piece, um, that you know, we'll have these countries leading in artificial intelligence and effectively providing services to um, other countries that don't have this capability, and that this will be, in some ways, like a new type of colonialism, where, um, but one that is very difficult to emerge out of. I don't know the answer to these questions, um, how we avoid this future. I think it's one of the key questions that we need to answer going forwards. What I think is a first step is making sure that the countries who are going to be affected in this way have a seat at the table and actually have a voice on these issues. Um, I think that one of the biggest problems that um, we've had until recently is that the global conversation has been so dominated by a few voices. So on the impacts of AI, um, a lot of it has been the US and um, Europe. Uh, there's a lot of work happening in China, but in the West, we're less uh, aware of it. There's a lot of great work happening in Singapore, but in the West, uh, we're less aware of it. Andrew Ng famously said on AI research that um, it's like a one-way mirror. In China, they know all about what's happening in the West, but nobody in the West knows what's happening in China, not because they're keeping anything secret, but because nobody you know, has learned Mandarin or nobody's reading about it. I think some of the same is true about some of the great work that's happening in um, Singapore. So the first thing is actually to be talking to each other and to learn about what's happening in different parts of the world. The second is to make sure that there is representation from the countries um, who are potentially going to be in these um, sort of um, service accepting positions as opposed to being um, leaders in AI. What the solutions beyond that look like, I'm not sure. Maybe it involves um, doing what we can now to encourage innovation in AI development and application in these countries. Uh, for example, by um, sort of encouraging um, education or by setting up um, centers in these places. Maybe it involves putting in place um, legal and regulatory rules that mean that there can't be an exploitative um, arrangement between a leading country and um, a lagging country. Um, I mean, we have very much imperfect rules around trade of this sort, but we at least have tried to put rules in place of this sort. But I think a first step is just to recognize there may be a problem and to make sure, and to recognize that there are voices who are going to be profoundly affected by AI who are not part of the current conversation. Um, one of my key concerns is I mentioned things like the Partnership on AI, which I think is an absolutely wonderful initiative. However, of the participating organizations, I would say 90, 95% are um, Western, um, US, or um, European, um, well, also New Zealand. But they're English-speaking and um, Western in outlook. And if we're to get to a point where we're having a proper global conversation, we need to have more representation from other parts of the world. And I think this is not a deliberate choice by the partnership. It's just a, an ongoing process to build these links. And I hope to see them build um, much stronger links to um, leading research groups um, in other parts of the world over the next couple of years. We have just time for one last question. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not an expert in this area, but I'm wondering if anyone is examining the impact of AI on human intelligence long term. So I know that a close collaborator and friend of mine, Jose Fernandez Orello, is um, very interested in this topic. Um, he released a book last year called The Measure of All Minds, which is all about 
um, well, how we define and measure intelligence in a lot of different ways, and particularly how we measure progress in artificial intelligence. I know that he has a keen interest in how AI is likely to affect human intelligence that um, he's developing grant applications around at the moment. He's interested in questions like, well, as we effectively outsource more processes to AI systems, will our own kind of internal knowledge and our ability to solve problems atrophy in some ways, or will it free us up to be able to sort of think higher thoughts? Um, I guess a broader issue is that in some senses, this is kind of what's been happening over the course of um, human history. Um, you know, writing allows us to store memories and information external to us. A calculator allows us to um, not have to do the numbers in our head, and that's certainly affected human intelligence in a number of different ways. Um, not necessarily bad. And um, so I know that some people working in AI are excited about the idea that maybe AI automates a number of the boring aspects of what we spend our um, brains thinking about and leaves us free to think about the really kind of creative and high level things that AI systems still can't do. Um, That is absolutely right. And it's, I think, a key concern that's often lost in these discussions. Um, yeah. All I can say is I fully agree with you on that. And I think there's a real question about if we automate those things, what do those people do? Um, do we see a Keynesian future where like, the remaining work is distributed 10 hours a week across everyone else? Um, I personally think that's kind of unlikely. I worry about a situation in which a lot of people effectively are unemployable and a lot of people, and then like a subset of people are doing all the work and are getting all of the, um, well, the financial benefits of this. Um, I worry that, like, I know that there are economists working on this issue of whether AI would exacerbate um, resource inequality and change the labor versus capital um, share of income and in doing so affect social mobility because if you can't affect your status in life by working your way up if it's instead about like you know how much resource you have or how much you own then society potentially becomes a lot more ossified um, so I know economists are thinking about this issue um, I know some cognitive scientists are thinking about um, this question I think not enough people are thinking about it, and I think the challenges are going to go from the hypothetical to the real more quickly than we would ideally like. So I think they're really good questions. I'm sure our discussion has been very stimulating. This is the tip and an iceberg, and I think all of you will be very eager to interact with Sean. I think we have a break. Um, after this. So in the meantime, uh, why don't you join me to thank Sean for his absolutely stimulating discussion. Thank you.